We're not going to make any money, and it probably won't go to New York. It probably won't have a life beyond that. But that's the other part of doing this. As I said to Des, Des, got to be in that room. Got to be a part of that. Got to see how we can make that work, because it should work. And if it doesn't work, so what? We try it. And he, he understands that, because that's Des. You know, Des does exactly the same thing. You know, he walks into a room with 80 or 85 people sitting there looking at him, waiting for him to say something, and then he starts. And he makes something happen that very, very few people in the world can make happen. He's a world-class director. He's working at the Met right now, putting on a big opera. Uh, he's... He's another reason why you go to Stratford. Brian Bedford is a reason why you go to Stratford. <laughs> and that's why I say to you, uh, because you're ultimately the most important people of all, you've got to understand what you've got out there. That's an extraordinary resource. We don't have anything like in the States. Well, to, to our regret, Thank you. So just understand what it is. Cherish it. Uh, just before we go on to the next question, I should mention, uh, luckily, if you're not aware, the Stratford season does go on to the end of October, and Brian's going to be here doing the homecoming and Twelfth Night until then. And they're amazing performances and amazing productions, and you really ought to go see them if you haven't. So get up there. Okay. <laughs> next yeah. question. Thank you. Yeah. I had the privilege of seeing homecoming. Am I, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. And it was thrilling. It was really a spectacular ensemble performance. I agree, all the actors were amazing. Yeah, they are. The thing, I think uh, we were definitely invited to discuss, to think about, to argue about what the play meant, uh, what we got out of it, and that's great theater. Uh, one of the things we could not one of the many things we couldn't agree on or were curious about, maybe you can explain it. Uh, when Pinter wrote the play, he did he cast the woman, uh, I guess it was his wife at the time, Vivian, Vivian Merchant. Merchant. Yep. Yeah. But this director chose to cast the woman as a black woman. Mm. And it it seemed to us or to me that it added, not maybe added, even detracted or confused uh, some of the issues there. Uh, and I wondered what, how you felt about that. Well, I think, first of all, he, he cast the right actress. Uh, Kara Ricketts is an amazing, amazing it, actress. And geez. yeah, wasn't as, I that said, as I said before, uh, the genius of Des, in, in that particular choice, fitted in so beautifully with the genius of Harold Pinter. Because Pinter's objective in writing that play was to make you feel uncomfortable. So if, if her race in that particular situation, the fact that she suddenly, even though she's a black woman, never referred to, of course, it never is, is in any way in the play referred to, but as a black woman, considering the, the, uh, the uh, pain and the difficulty and the, and the huge years, centuries of oppression that black people uh, have, have suffered, uh, uh, if that put a, a particular twist on that character, good, what's wrong with that? The whole thing was, the whole play is supposed to be, what, what's fascinating about, in the context of what you've just said, is that there's only one person standing at the end of the play. And that's Ruth. Ruth yeah. is the boss. Ruth, wrote, Ruth controls Definitely. the environment. I mean, Lenny thinks he does, but he doesn't. Ruth is sitting there, and she has, by agreeing, although she hasn't abased herself, but she potentially has agreed to abase herself, she dominates. She wins. Now, Pinter got himself in all kinds of trouble with the feminists with this point of view, but Pinter's response to it was interesting. Well, if the point is power, if the point is coming up with power, who's to say that's not a legitimate application of power? Ultimately, she has the power. 
ultimately she comes up with the power at the end of the play. Mm -hmm. she, she can destroy these people as she has, we ostensibly think about Teddy, and certainly Max is destroyed, purely by this look, or even not a look, just a look away, this regal uh, acceptance of, of, the, of the, what, what she feels is due her. And anyway, the thing is not to think that there's any specific ending, not that there's any specific conclusion to be reached. Right. Because Pinter, you know, here's Pinter, a guy who had this extraordinary life, won the Nobel Prize, was ex had these two fantastic, worked these amazing plays, wrote screenplay, brilliant screenplays, made a lot of money, spent a lot of money, and died of cancer. Painful, painful cancer. How confusing is that? That's life. That's what life is. <laughs> That's what life is. It's all of this effort and strain and consumption and grabbing a hold and pulling it to yourself and saying, I've got this, I've got this, and then you die. And, you know, if you die in your bed and, you, you know, and you're not even aware of it, good luck to you. Or if you die, as the Irish say, roaring, it doesn't make any difference. And all the things that you've done up to that point, virtually other things, as far as you're concerned, make no difference at all because you're not there anymore. That's right. Well, Pinter got that. And, you know, that's part of what he's writing about always. Always writing about it, you know. Uh, 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 the play uh, No Man's Land is so much about that. I mean... He, he was friends with a writer named Philip Larkin, and if you've never read any of his poetry, uh, I, I, can't enth I can only enthusiastically recommend it. Now, Larkin was not the happiest guy in the world, as you can see by his poetry, but it is stunning and powerful stuff. And uh, Dennis Potter, who was a friend of mine, and uh, uh, wrote the same kind of thing, the same the awareness of all this stuff. Um, it's, you know, it's this cosmic joke. It's this cosmic joke, you know, you bust your ass, you strain, you hustle, you think, do all this stuff. And what, what, was, uh, what was the old Woody Allen line? Life sucks and then you die. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's what he's writing about. And, and that, it's disturbance. He wants to disturb you. He wants to rattle you. He wants to knock you off your pins. And he wants he to make it uncomfortable for you. Yeah. And you know something? That's also the point of art. I agree. Uh, and, the, and, the, and the theater and movies are not supposed to make you, just supposed to make you feel good and make you laugh. I agree. They're supposed to do something else. <laughs> I agree completely. Anyway, it was a treat. I highly recommend good. that Thanks. everybody see it. And thank Great. you. Thank you. Uh, Interesting, just to, one more small thing on that. About a year ago, I was privileged to interview Antonia Fraser, who is Harold Pinter's widow now. And uh, I mentioned to her that there was going to be a, a black actor playing Ruth in The Homecoming. And she said, oh, yes, they did that in England. It's marvelous, especially at the end of the first act, when Max is insulting her so much, the audience got so uncomfortable, and Harold would have loved it. <laughs> Which is exactly what you said before. So it's fascinating. Well, Billi you know, Billington, that. Michael Billington, who's a famous British critic and also uh, not only the biographer, a wonderful biography of, of Pinter, but also a very close friend of Pinter's, was here before we actually did the show. And myself and Jennifer had dinner with him, and he was fascinated to meet Jennifer because as far as Billington was concerned, he knew of no other woman who had ever directed uh, a homecoming, and he was fascinated by her take on it, which is somewhat different from his and mine, frankly. <laughs> but anyway, we have about time for one more question. So thank Actually, you. Well, that we could do this through the three people that are standing. Okay, okay, okay we'll do them quickly. Okay. To ask you what, it, uh, if you would talk a little bit about working with Jennifer Tarver, please. Well, Jennifer is a pain in the ass. Um, no, she's uh, she and I uh, are very very close friends. We fight constantly, um, and she's constantly moaning about my intransigence, and I'm constantly moaning about hers. She is, and this is the most important thing about Jennifer, she's the most honest person I have ever met. 
And for a director, that is the most important quality. What does it mean? What does it really mean? How, how do we get to this truth? If this is the truth, how do we get there? I mean, when I was doing uh, Crap's Last Tape, and I would do something, and the audience, you know, there might be some designers, there might be some technicians or ADs in the rehearsal room, would laugh. And Jennifer would look at me unsmilingly and say, that's funny, that's funny. She meant it, but she was looking at it as a surgeon. <laughs> and, and, a, 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 and for a surgeon, there is nothing, there can be nothing else but honesty. What is there? What's lying there? When I open this up, what's there? What's the truth of it? You know, what is this tumor here? What is this blood vessel here? It's got to be honest. It has to be honest. And to have someone directing, especially an actor like myself who's flying off in all different directions constantly, to have a director, a woman 40, 41, 42 years old, brilliant, smart as hell, who has done an enormous amount of work on this particular, more than I have when we get into the room, to honestly react to something and say, this is right, this is true, this is real, this is not. Um, you know, you can't have a more valuable partner than that. Thank so you. she and I are very close and we will be, I mean, there are times when we get frustrated with each other, no question about it, but that's the way it should be. Thank you, great. Next. Hi. I, uh, Started to take away from the theater. Uh, I just uh, I saw a movie fi 15, 20 years ago where you played uh, the big bully of a town. Yeah, based One on of my a real favorites story. Yeah. Performances of yours. That must have been fun, twirling your mustache. <laughs> <laughs> that was a real guy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he was shot. He was shot. It was an interesting philosophical problem. Actually, at the end of that, it was a small town in, in Missouri where they had this guy pl uh, uh, essentially terrorizing the town. And because they were such a small town, there were no police services. So even though he was constantly in trouble with the state police, they couldn't do anything about him because nobody would, everybody was too afraid to bring him to justice. So one day they killed him. Yeah. And everybody killed him. And the, the, the ph philosophical question at the end of it was, well, what is justice? What is, what is the police activity. When does, the, when, does, when does justice become a group of so-called you know, law-abiding citizens saying, we can't get anybody to protect us, we're going to have to protect ourselves, which is essentially what a police service is, right? You hire somebody to protect you. You know, there is a philosophical, an interesting philosophical discussion to be had there. Yeah, it's now, I'm not going to suggest that we had it in terms of this TV movie, but I remember we had a lot of it talking about the, the producers and the, uh, and the directors and, and so forth. But he, w he was killed and, and uh, they desperately tried to get some people indicted in the town, but they could not do so because nobody in the town would testify against them. It's interesting you bring that up. Uh, we had an incident four or five years ago in Alberta where four RCMP officers were killed. And same situation where this man, everybody was scared of him. Yeah. And he got away with it? No, he got killed in the incident. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, our last question. Hi, Mr. Dennehy. I just want to thank you for taking one of your really rare nights off to travel this way and be here with us. Um, well, I was here for the shindig for Chris last night. So. <laughs> About 14 years ago, I had the pleasure of being in a remotely forgettable, forgettable uh, miniseries called Tom Clancy's Net Force that you were also in, and I had the pleasure of meeting you in the uh, makeup room. And... Uh, 
as um, an actress who got her start in America, I feel very strongly about the union because it was the only way I would have had health insurance. And in this day and age, there seems to be a very different attitude towards unions. And I find that my friends in the theater uh, and on film and TV in Canada and in the UK seem to have a very different attitude towards the union because they don't depend upon it for their health insurance. Mm. And I'm just curious what your opinion might be about well, the unions uh, at this I point. mean, they're always, unions can always be frustrating, but at the same time, I'm getting a pension for my union, which I hope uh, I will continue to receive. So uh, uh, I've been in unions ever since I was a kid. Uh, it, it, the the thing about unions is, you know, w w the problem the problem that's going on in the states now, for example, in California, you have a situation where somehow a California teacher uh, can teach for 25 or 30 years, say, wind up making 85 or 90 thousand dollars a year, and then go on pension and make 115 or 120 thousand dollars a year in pension. And there is some questions as to the appropriateness of this. Uh, so that, uh, you know, it, it, I certainly have benefited from being in the Screen Actors Guild and the Actors' Equity. But there are some excesses that are happening, especially in situations where you have unions working very, very closely with state governments, usually state or county governments. Uh, so I'm not prepared to, uh, to judge on that. I mean, obviously, we're, we're in such trouble in the states now in terms of the money that we owe that, um, um, uh, you know, we all better start learning how to speak Mandarin here, pretty sure. <laughs> but anyway, thank you. Thank you. Brian. <laughs> Just, what? And, and of course the problem is I've got kids and grandchildren and we're just passing, we're just shoveling all this crap onto them. And I'm very aware of that these days. Yeah, one last thing before we go, is there, one part, one project, one something you haven't done you want to do? Well, of course, the big one that, uh, you know, is still in my head that perhaps, and Jennifer and I keep flirting around with it, is Lear. Only because it's, uh, only because, primarily because it's the one you got to do. You know, you got to try to. And, uh, you know, I saw uh, Chris do his magnificent one a couple of years ago, and... Bedford, and I remember Paul Schofields, and you know, you can't really avoid it, so we probably will do it someplace and see how that all works. I mean, as long as there is an O'Neill part to do, I'll be pretty happy about that, but uh, I'm running out of those. <laughs> so I, I, you know, I suppose one of these days, she and I will take on Lear, um, if I live long enough. Brian, thank you for everything. I don't even buy uh, pants and shirts anymore. I buy socks and underwear. <laughs> I got enough pants and shirts and suits to last me, no problem. Thank you. <laughs>